Thanks for being here, everybody. Um, I'm Curtis. This is Andy. This is a session about Gore Boom, collections of largely Gore songs. And we have um, uh, a lot of uh, front end that will, in which we attempt to show you what our thinking process was as we tried to define what we thought was important to talk about. Um, it comes out of our, both of our work as um, historians of literature. Uh, I would say actually there's slightly more emphasis on that here and what we've given you in the handout. Um, but then also, of course, translators. And also it comes out of a reflection of, re reflection on what we think might happen over the next day, uh, over the next decade that would put us in a position to understand better the literary history of gore, of, of poetic song in Tibet. Let me say just uh, two, two words about the mm -hmm. title that's on your handout. Mm -hmm. So the title, Getting to the Boom, is that we had some fun <laughs> playing around yeah. with the idea of boom, kaboom. You know. um, but one of the ideas was thinking about or questioning the difference between gore and gore boom. Is there a difference when we think about gore in the individual and maybe in the abstract um, and collections? So the idea of collections and the drive to collect and collectivity themselves is something that we want to emphasize. Um, but I'll also emphasize the second part of the title. It's a brief, although it is an eight-page handout. We apologize. An impressionistic survey of gore collections. So in mm -hmm. kind of emphasis on the Im in impressionistic side, even though it's parenthetical here, um, in that we've tried to raise a bunch of questions, which we'll go through, but then to pull out some what we feel may be representative um, collections of certain moments in the history of Gorbum production that tell us something about this drive towards creating collections. But we realize that it's necessarily incomplete, um, and so we hope that as, as our own collective that we can think about things that might be missing or places that we might look to make this survey uh, somewhat less impressionistic. Okay. So we have a series of questions uh, that I, I think we'll start to work through for the, and we'll maybe take upwards of a half an hour and try and leave a solid time for uh, discussion. So we have two things that we'd really like to get through and that's the questions and the periodization on page two. And maybe we'll leave off the um, uh, part three um, and to see whether we have time and interest in, in working through uh, some real shallow bird's eye views of, of some major collections. And then the, the last thing that we actually provided you with is an appendix, uh, an outline of this book that I've mentioned several times, uh, Dundrup Gao's History and Features of, um, of Gourlou, uh, because I, th I do continue to think that it's an important book for us to pay attention to when we're talking and, about And it's, it's, it's helpful even in, in looking at his outline, uh, mm -hmm. the kinds of categories and yeah. divisions of categories that he uses um, as a native speaker and reader of Tibetan in thinking about Gore. So. Do you want to bring us so into the yeah. question? Oh. Yeah, why don't you start with our, no, okay. start our questions? All right, yeah. so we have a, so when we were sitting down to think about, we were sort of tasked with the, with the topic of thinking about Gorboom, translation in Gorboom, and um, spent a considerable amount of time trying to think about what it even means to, I don't know, to, to think about Gore collections. Um, what were the problems, both from a practical point of view, where do we find them? How do we get them? What do we know that's out there? But also how to begin to think about them as a kind of, I don't know, an autonomous kind of literary form. So we came up with a number of kind of broad categorical questions about history, terminology, content, size, translations. Where do we go from here? So we thought we'd spend some time um, telling you about our thought process in putting the panel together, organizing the panel. But I, I, w I should say that we're happy to make this kind of uh, dialogical. I mean, if you want to jump in and you have questions of your own or ideas, um, please do that. <laughs> Here. <laughs> I just, I just want to ask what you mean by impressionistic, so I understand your uh, Impressionistic means that it's, it, it's our provisio that it's not complete. Right? It's, oh, okay. it, it's, 
it's uh, the, the idea of a survey made from a few examples that we gotcha. found were readily okay. Okay. available, and the kinds of, I don't know, narratives that we were able to, to tell about Gore collections, about their from development, the from this very small sample. Okay, thank you. Okay. I was just going to bring it in. It's, okay. a great it's a great question, yeah. though. Yeah, and I mean we were there's a number of things it could mean. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're uh, so we're we're trying to be honest about the limitations that we That's have, and maybe we all have in thinking about Gore collections. Because I mean, obviously, there's been a lot of work, a lot of translation, a lot of theorizing and, and historical work has been done on Gore as a form of literature and, and practice and ritual. But I think the question of Gore collections themselves, especially as a literary form, has not been um, addressed as seriously. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's as, yeah. Okay, so, so we begin uh, kind of the, the ground level of history. And this is thinking about gore as a, as a form. So when were the first gore? And connected to that, when was the first gore boom? And of course, those are questions, in, implicit in those questions are issues of genre and terminology and classification and what do we mean by gore and when is a gore not a gore, so we can talk about that. Um, what were the formative early collections? And when does namtar, which is a genre that we're all familiar with, um, when does when does that sort of transform or, or, or when do we find a, a, a related genre? of nam gore, right? That is a combined namtar and gore boom. So when do those kinds of collections, which are collections of gore's poetry, but also with a kind of narrative uh, prose sections as well, when, when do they first begin oh. to appear? And then finally, uh, oh, no, no, go ahead. Uh, when do non kagyu examples of nam gore and gore boom appear? So we have a, a general sense, an impressionistic sense that among the earliest and most important gore that we find, they're related to kind of early kagyu. And so what are the counterexamples? What are the non-kagyu examples of those? Just to dwell so on this yeah. section for a moment in response to your mm -hmm. question, I mean, it really means, impressionistic means w we, we talked it out. We didn't use much more to create this periodization. We did a, a little bit of bibliographic research, but we mostly just talked about what we knew, right? Mm -hmm. Which is it's a great starting point for thinking about creating a, um, a, a, his, a, a, a history, right? But then the, the next stage would be to do bibliographic research in earnest and try and get the most extant examples of, of Gore collections that you can together and create a chrono chronology to the best of one's ability, right? And it's very possible in this day and age to do that. Um, and then um, that kind of work is, is r right in this roughly hierarchical list of activities, it's only one form of work, right? In, 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 but that would be a great starting point for moving ahead into thinking about the, the, the form, content, and context of Gore with some better bibliographic appreciation and chronological appreciation of their, what we have available to us. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like yeah. This. Well, if you turn to page three, we're going to ask you all to do some painting. Yes. Uh, that's the. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. Who is your favorite impressionistic gore performer? <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Terminology. Terminology. Yeah. Terminology. Okay. So, um, it, the, the, as we started to work through examples of uh, gore boom, gore collections, we. we we started to ask ourselves questions about the limits, the, the, the scope and the limits of that, of a range of terms that mean more or less the s same thing, right? So there doesn't seem to be anything called a, a, a loo boom. It's, hmm. it's, it's, it's strange, right? Um, there, there are gore boom, but not really loo boom. There are gore boom that don't really have that many things called gore in them. They have a lot of things called loo in them. Um, so it's a flexible, it's a flexible category, both as a name for a particular kind of poem, but but also in terms of a, of of, of, a, of a container. To can can yeah. I interject something? This is I actually just thought of this now. I did mention it when we were working on it. It's not on the that, list. That, that I've only. Can't oh, talk about. Okay. Yeah. No. No. Go ahead. Go ahead. 
The one <laughs> reference to Lou collection I remember seeing was an early survey of Mila materials by this 14th century figure, Shijie Jupa, uh, who actually describes having seen or having possession of a Lou collection attributed to Mila Repa, his, his collection of Lou from the early part of his life. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember what the term he uses for collection. I think it's not Lou Boom. He doesn't use the word Boom, but it is specifically a collection of his Lou as opposed mm -hmm. to his Gore. Mm -hmm. yeah. But that mm -hmm. text, as far as I know, has never been attested. We didn't. We no, no longer exists. Huh. So yeah. But that's the one reference. Right. It's not to, to that say that there's not. Right. And so, mm -hmm. um, Lone Chimpo, his collection of songs is called it's Dorje Lu, right. blah, 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 Karchak, right? Right. And, right? and it's got gore in it. Right. Um, so, but anyway, I, I mean, the, the point is not to presume that there's meaning to these, um, kind, th these kinds of collection terms for collections, but to pose it as a question, right? Is it meaningful and when is it meaningful? And, mm -hmm. And then why should we care, right? These are all great questions to ask, but part of that starting point is to get a range of terminology. So you, you know, you're not thinking about just everything, but you're not just thinking about one thing either. Um, what is the origin of the genre term boom as a marker for these c collections? It's an old word, right? um, and it, 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 at some point probably, I mean, if I had to guess, I would say it's associated um, first with Prajnaparamita literature in the imperial mm -hmm. translation period, but I'm not totally sure about that. Um, but eventually it becomes this, this kind of type term right, that can mean collection. And then and I think more interesting is when these things that look um, potentially generic um, as, as, uh, as terms for types of literature or types of collections, and they become, uh, their use becomes more specific. So you see Gourbon, but you, you, you don't, you don't see Lubo necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, are there particular traditions that have to make a gore boom? Right. So, th and this comes out uh, again of an impression I had that by the let's say um, by the by the sixteenth century, um, if you were a Karmapa um, uh, intellectual worth your salt, you had to make a gore boom. Right? That was just one of the things that had to be in your sung boom then. Um, so, uh, w whereas you, t I mean, typically, again, th there's g always going to be counter, <coughs> counter examples um, among the great um, Amdo writers from the from the from the um, late 17th, 18th century forward. Uh, it doesn't seem to be a, a, a kind of unspoken um, um, uh, expectation that you're going to have a guru boom in your collection, even if you're known as a great poet. Right? You're not necessarily going to have a guru boom, even if you write guru. And so there's a difference, right? right? By, seven, by, um, by 18th century, you're a Karmapa writer. Um, the, the limited evidence we have from the 18th century, um, uh, you're going to write a guru boom. Right? Gay Lupas, maybe not so much. Huh? So, w w so then a part of the question becomes, um, well, how, does, how do these preferences and these expectations play out in time and place? But then what difference do they make, too? both in terms of our engagement with the literature, but also our sense of what these kinds of literatures mean in relationship to the context of our writers that we're, that we're, that we're invested in mm, or translating. Content? So then we turn mm. to the content of collections themselves. So we posed a question, what makes a classic Gorbu? So like they say about rock and roll, it doesn't have to be an old to be a classic. Um, mm -hmm. But there are some collections. I mean, we we'll probably turn first to the Mila Gorbun. What would sit in the, what would, who would be inducted? What would be inducted into the Gorbun Hall of Fame? And the Mila Gorbun is the, maybe the most famous model, in part because it's one of the few Gorbun, the Gor collections that's been translated now multiple times in its entirety. So we don't have a lot of those. And one thing we might think about is, are there other translations that are not well known and what should be the target of the next translation? Mm -hmm. um, but what makes a kind of classic Gorbu? And we have, have our uh, kind of brief surveys of two collections, so thinking about Mila, the Mila Gorbun as a collection and Shavkar's Gorbu as a collection, which are really different. They're similar in some ways, but different also. And the similarities and differences are both interesting, but they're both in a sense kind of classic Gorbu. 
What difference, if any, does it make if Gore are Tibetan or of Indian origin? So I mean, we have collections of songs associated with the Indian masters of Doha, the Doha Kosha. Um, is there a difference in terms of content or form that we would find in those kinds of collections? And then kind of reflecting about uh, on what's in the name that's a, a attributed to the individual works in a Gore collection. So we can think of Doha, of Gore, of Lu, Chi, Zhe, Yang. Yang is a word that is, is used very frequently. Tangyu Naruka uses it in his survey, mm -hmm. in his Karchak of mm -hmm. Gore, more than he does Gore itself, mm -hmm. even though he was responsible for editing, collecting and editing the Nora Gore Boom. Um, and our, uh, clearly we have distinctions of terms and, and genres, but how important are those distinctions in, in practice? And finally, and maybe most importantly, what are the different kinds of organizational schemes that were used in putting together collections? So collections can be quite large, which entails certain kind of organizational principles. And what are they? So in the Mila collection, it really is about, well, if we have a chance to get to it, we'll see that there were different schemes that were used. But in the Tongyun version, it really is about cycles uh, relating to encounters with disciples and classifications of disciples, non-humans, human disciples, in the miscellaneous work. Um, whereas Shapkar's Gorboom is really organized by geography, travel to various places. Um, you could look at smaller collections like Rangjin Dorje's, the Third Karmapa's Gore, which is just a collection. So this is uh, Ruth Gamble has done a wonderful translation of this collection in her dissertation, which we hope will be published. wasn't included in her book. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily seem at first glance like there's an overarching organizational principle. Um, so what can we say about the content of Gore collections and the level of individual Gore, but also on the structural kind of meta level of their organizational principles? Yeah, size we can deal with quickly. Um, it, it may seem like a trivial thing, and in some ways it is. Um, uh, because we know that there are, you know, famous um, poems or songs that um, you know, are, are famous in their own right. They're not necessarily associated with any collection. No. Uh, but one thing I've found is that the size of a given um, work can be connected with interesting things going on intellectual, intellectually. So the, the main place where I've seen that, and I bet you could probably <coughs> replicate this or, or work through this as a as a kind of thought tool for, for asking historical questions uh, is in Namtar. And it looks to me like the growth in the size of uh, Namtar, just the number of pages, uh, is connected to the growth of a literary criticism of Namtar, too. And in fact, there were debates between um, Gelukpas and uh, Kagyus about how much uh, how much detail about what kind of topics around a person's life you're going to include in a given namtar. So one of the ways to track the growth of things that people were actually talking about is to track um, just how big or how small they made these things. Mm -hmm. so, so it's a question to pose, I think, um, which and yet is a setup for other kinds of historical So the counterexample yeah. to that is in mm -hmm. the early Mila collection where the Gorboom mm -hmm. appears in a really extensive form in the earliest period of ah, a kind yeah. of literary production about Milarepa, in contrast to the Namtar. So the Namtar was really, really short, but the Gorboom was really, really big from an early period, which seems to be uh, contrary to the rise of these really massive Namtars, which happens mm -hmm. only centuries later. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just say one other thing about size as like one of the data points that, that are interesting to collect as you look at something like a, um, a a particular genre of literature or a particular type of collection. Uh, it's good, I think important, and, and is gonna move us forward in terms of our generalized understanding of Tibetan literature to look at not only time but place too and to pay attention to um, not only uh, the moment of authorship but the moment of production and reproduction too. Well, we have so many texts available to us and one of the great things we can do with all of those witnesses of texts, sometimes of multiple copies that 
are going to be from the from the standpoint of interpretation or translation maybe not so meaningful, but from the standpoint of history, they're 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 essential. Um, so it, it, I think a great place to look for that kind of um, work is, is, is Andy's first book on, second book, your, your, your monograph <coughs> on the spread of the Milo Repo tradition up to the time of Tsang and Hiruka. And a lot of that work is done in, with book history methods, right? by just attending to the multiple witnesses that he collected over a decade. It's gotten much easier to do that work with BDRC and the, all of the collections that we, that we have available to us now. You want to go to? Sure. So then we come to the uh, uh, list of questions that maybe would be a useful place for us to pause and actually start to mm. think about, because it turns to the work that we're all concerned with in translation and is really the topic of this workshop. So now I'm trying to remember what we were thinking with this first bullet point. <laughs> Representing difference over time. Do you remember what we were thinking with that? Oh, well, it looks really intriguing. It, it? it does. I think yeah. we should really pause on, uh, on that. Um, I know we were, we were puzzling over the, the, the question of like approach to translating style. I mean, a gore boom is by definition a collection of gore. And is there a need for consistency? Or what's the what level of consistency should we strive for in translating a, a, a body of work that is a self-contained unit? So if you've translated one, if you translate it all, means that if, you, if you've really looked at one gore, do you kind of understand what all of the gore in, are in that collection? Or do you really need a careful and close and deep kind of granular reading of the entire collection? Um, are there distinct issues? Oh, do you want to well, Are you going to go to the second bullet point, or are you going to? Well, that was kind of was jumping that? over the first one because I. Dang it! Oh no, we no! But I had a, something for the first one. Oh, go. That was go coming ahead. off okay. of, of, of Ben's Ben yeah. we workshop Ben's um, translation of um, of Ling Repo, right? Yeah, Ling Repo yesterday, and um, he, so right, we've got a nice, if not exactly pretty, block print from the 16th century of, of Ling Repo's collection, right? That's where the that's where the most songs come together for the first time, as far as you know, right? Mm -hmm. But we have many earlier examples. Right? So, so one question becomes, if you're, if you're looking at the work as a whole and you're trying to figure out a context that you're going to try and I I evoke um, a sense of meaning within an historical context, are you looking at the 16th century when there was ex this explosion of Gorboom that that was a part of? Or are you looking at the, um, at the 12th century, right? Where's your imagined historical uh, uh, realm that you're trying to work within right, and create a world in which to situate that. Mm -hmm. And I, I think from in our fields, we don't ask that question that much because because there's not a lot of us doing this relative to other fields. If you're in classics and you're translating, um, you know, Marcus Aurelius for the for the for the thirty fifth time. You're asking that question in a very deep and, and serious way, right? and I actually think that we'll 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 get there in, in fits and starts where we where we start to think more about like how am I going to place this thing in a, in a world and what difference does the time and the regional context make for kinds of translation choices I make and who are their friends right who are who are those gore's friends right? Mm -hmm. right are they all the people that were printed at the same time or are they all the people back in the 12th century who Or earlier, yeah, right, uh-huh, yeah. Should we just move on to the last point? Mm. Sure, yeah, go ahead, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, you go. Well, <laughs> so where do we go from here? So what, what, what might we see our collective task uh, in trying to kind of better understand mm -hmm. the, the universe of Gorboom? Well, a first task might be to put together to compile a more complete bibliography of Gore collections across all periods, uh, regions, um, language dialects. Um, I think our understanding of even what is available, what was produced is, is at this point kind of limited. So we know what the classic collections are. How can we fill that out? Um, 
how can we refine our sense of periodization of moments of change or development in the uh, process of collecting gore? And we'll give you a kind of one, one possible periodization. Um, we need a deeper and broader study of earliest examples of both gore and gore collections that will give us a sense of origins. Um, and will give us a sense of regional and historical contexts for the production of gore collections. Um, we need a better sense of organizational frameworks. What were the kind of theoretical um, constructs that, that allowed for the production of, of gore collections? And then what are some examples of gore collections that stretch our understanding of what gore collections are? So what's outside, what's beyond the classic definition of a gore boom? What's the prog rock version of gore collections? Is that too much of a stretch to say? Not, an, not at all, okay. no, no, no. Would, would one mm -hmm. um, category of questions mm -hmm. that could possibly be added be um, performance practice? Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and it's actually I think it's something that we had discussed and didn't make yeah. it into our notes. And we were because we were thinking about um, like meta level texts that reflect on the on the tradition of gore practice and gore collection. And there are a few, there aren't many, but there's like a famous one um, by the Eighth Karmapa in the Kagyu Gurtso. and then there's an anonymous work that was also included in the Kagyu Gurtso that really is about performance, how gore should be performed. And those, that, that's really interesting. Right? Um, there are a few other kind of meta-level texts about gore collections. Sanyin Haruka uh, wrote a short one that Stefan Larson and I got translated and published. And then there were a few others, Karma Chabne and, uh, um, and a few others um, that might be places to turn, as well as the kind of contemporary oral tradition just about gore performance. But I think the performative as aspect of it is really crucial. Does he have a gore collection? No. Mm. Not that I know of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would have probably noticed that. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah, maybe just back, uh, one more comment about the translation section here in those latter questions, how to maintain consistency in a large collection. Um, we all start by translating one poem. How does that change if you think about translating a collection? Um, and I would just say a little bit more about that. Um, right, there's a sense in which creating a history of Gorboom is just giving ourselves a, a lot of materials to work with. Right? <laughs> we just want to know what's there. Right? Um, but then a, a, a separate question is, when does a collection become an aesthetic object that's valuable um, to the tradition in some way that, that's, that's distinct from the individual pieces that it collects? Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think we can probably see that, um, probably starting with Mila Rampa. Yeah. Um, so do we, we want to move to our... I don't know, do we want to pause here? Or do yeah. you want to... Maybe we we'll pause here for a second. Yeah, let's yeah. Uh, uh -huh. take some yeah. questions, mm -hmm. comments. Yeah. Can I come over there? Yes, uh, yes, you can. Please. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, yes, we can. Gila, sure. <laughs> yes, you can. Do you want a marker? Do we have a marker? No marker? Does anybody have a marker in their pack? Mm -hmm. I, okay. I failed. Every academic should carry a whiteboard marker. <laughs> in I keep yeah. forgetting my question point. Uh -huh. Sharpie, don't, uh, they, I don't know. Appreciate that. Sharpie will be bad. Yeah. Uh -huh. Can I ask a question while yeah. we're yeah. uh -huh. together? Uh, mm -hmm. Just if you know, I wonder if any uh, English anthologies, like say the Oxford of English Verse, has been mm -hmm. translated into other languages and whether the terminology is consistent or not. I'm just kind of oh. curious about that. Do you no. That's anybody? a good question. <laughs> I don't know. Um, anybody read a, a translation question. of a like the Norton anthology? set of? I'm really curious about, since I do so many anthologies, whether mm -hmm. you have to, 
But for multiple authors, yeah. if there's a need to be consistent in multiple authors. That would be something yeah. that I could Yeah, yeah that's a great question. I don't know, I have no idea. No. Of course, these are multiple Okay, authors. can you talk it out? Yeah. 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 Oh. Okay. No. Yeah, please, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And then you go Lu uh -huh. and you find the Lu uh -huh. G L U. Yeah. Uh -huh. Right? Is there any connection? Oh. Uh, so that's uh, one of the things. So that's uh. not my idea. I'm sorry. Uh -huh, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, you have the junction, you say it gives me the junction for copies, the junction medicine, other medicine. Oh, yes. uh, uh -huh, uh -huh. And, and uh, one of those, maybe we talked before, I don't remember. Uh. That I do not need that. <laughs> 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 but now we have it. Yeah. Yeah, so the Pemaku uh, wrote uh, uh. Uh, an article on the Lu, uh. Gu, uh. and Qi. Uh, uh, yeah. uh -huh. I think uh, the, oh, yeah. the uh -huh. limit of a publication of the Dharamsala publication, uh -huh. and the, that magazine, I think it's uh, that not yet. Uh, no, I, I don't know the Tolukia wrote the uh, uh, meaning of explaining what the Gu is. Hmm. What is a Lu is, but Pemagons, I think, if I yeah. remember correctly, he thinks that Gur is honorific term uh, uh -huh. for Lu. Mm. For Lu. Uh -huh. So Lu is yeah. regular. Mm. Yeah. So uh -huh. if the Lu's king is emperor singing, uh -huh. it's Gur. Uh -huh. So in that sense, Lama is singing, it's Gur. It's Gur. Yeah. So Lama, if Lama himself wrote that Gur, mm. he, he's not going to say I'm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You did you did tell me that, yeah. Mm. Uh -huh. So another mm. way of uh, mm. looking at these things, I think uh, the questions in the process. Mm. Uh, I must say that uh, these questions also Tibetans also have a discussion. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. So what yeah. is the first guru? <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. what, uh, what is the first mm. guru boom? That I, I seriously think mm. these questions. Uh, I mean, I never thought before. The why mm. we don't have number other than Kajuba. <laughs> mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, really kind of a uh, deep thing. Thank you. Mm. Thank you very much for oh. this thing. And uh, I worked on the history of Tibetan literature mm -hmm. way back uh, when <laughs> I was uh, really young and naive. <laughs> so uh, one of them, I tried to figure out, uh, very hard to figure out, and trying to figure out uh, one of the, I kind of found two language sets going on mm. in Tibetan language. Mm. One is uh, the translation style, and the uh, other is a, a spoken language mm. style, mm -hmm. uh, such as, if, uh, the, for example, one I remember is if you read the karma, 10 karma parts, Tokjus, Benzipamo, Kalabanki Lamdu, or those kinds of things, mm. it's a, it follows a little Dua style. Mm -hmm. I don't think that any Tibetan will speak the language <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, that uh, in, uh, he display in his uh, writing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, the, and, the, and the other hand, I think that these in Guru styles, you may find the Tibetan speak mm -hmm. the same mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in a regular con uh, conversational way. So in that sense, I think uh, maybe uh, Tibetans love singing songs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the starting mm -hmm. point, uh, who knows? <laughs> mm -hmm. First the Guru being sang entire comes there, something number singing, and his sister, is his sister the pe, Pemaka or Semaka? She is singing songs. And uh, then later on, that in singing songs, and uh, then song that uh, uh, the topic changes into Buddhist, Buddhist topic come in, and then that uh, kind of practice more. But uh, the, the, uh, the why they sing is, I think, the reason is that Tibetan love songs. Mm -hmm. That kind of my interpretation mm -hmm. uh, of uh, people coming here. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah good. Yeah. We need.
we need specialists in Tibetan music to come join yeah. us then yeah. too. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. 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 Other comments, questions? Just kind of an interesting note about mm -hmm. the terminology is that Ling Rip also wrote a commentary about Rao songs. Mm -hmm. And he didn't call them Doha, he called mm -hmm. them Gore. Gore. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I was thinking about Ooh, that one. Ling Rippa. Ling Rippa. He says Gore. Hmm. He called Do he called Saraha Doha. He, he called him Gore. Yeah. Saraha is Gore. Mm -hmm. So he's already domesticated them. Yeah, and it mm. seems like especially for the Kagyus, there's like very much a direct line. Yeah, they're very much trying to inter like um, domesticate the Doha creation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is that considered the translation mm -hmm. of Doha? Is it translated? I don't think there is a standard translation. Some people really? just transliterate. Right, Doha. so they write Doha. They say Doha, right? Yeah. Yeah. I've seen that. I just yeah. been yeah. wondering. I yeah. think I think more I think more Lu though hmm. for Doha. Really? Yeah. Really? In, the, in, the, in, the, in the in the Tengger, yeah, uh, it's Lu, not yeah, maybe later later, right? I think Gore's a little bit later, but in Tengger translations it's Lu, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Or it's uh, just Doha. <laughs> and then I also mm -hmm. was been wondering because I mm -hmm. talked about this somewhere else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, in the text, you know, whether it'll say it usually just says so and so said, not so and so sang. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know if that's an important distinction, and then it's often called more later just by people talking about it, but not, it doesn't seem to be definite evidence that it was actually sung originally. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I haven't done that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you want? No, sorry. Okay. Yeah. I was really compelled by this question of what makes a classic Gorbo, mm -hmm. and I wondered if we were going to, like, if you could share some of your experience looking at Gorbon mm. as to, especially maybe in Kagyu, for example, yeah. um, to see if there are types of songs that, um, that, that, that should be in the Gorbon, like yeah. if you tried to typify the songs, because yeah. it's just, you know, just like this shower of songs right. on this mm. Gorbon, and like, mm -hmm. can you make sense <laughs> of right. what's going on there? Um, That's a great question. Yeah, it is a good question. That would lead us to the lot to that section of the handout, which we could do now, but that will yeah. take some time to go through. Or do you want to? Let's do the history. No, let's do the history. Yeah, first. We, yeah. so so yeah. yes, I, th I I think we do have something to say about yeah. that. It's just I think maybe we want to hold off to work our way up to it. So, okay. Do you want to jump to this? Yeah, sure, 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 sure. So. I mean, we had some answers to our questions, but honestly, these are starting points, right? Um, and the one thing that we didn't make for you, which I feel really bad about now, is a bibliography of great works on Gore, because there is actually a lot, a, a, not a lot, but there's some great scholarship on Gore right now. So we have some of that on our computer, so feel free to, to ask for bibliography. Sure. Yep. Um, but, okay, so j just to throw down a starting point, it seems like there, um, that the word Gur is uh, early, earliest attested in uh, uh, the Dunhuan document, P Paleo Tibetan 1287, which is an uh, old Tibetan chronicle. And um, there's um, narrative uh, of, of, of um, kings, queens, and princes. And sometimes they sing Lu, and sometimes they sing Gur. Right? Um, so we have it there. Um, I. I personally have not done the research to, to differentiate based on style, uh, uh, voy uh, audience, or voice. I think there's probably something to make there. Honestly, this is not a whole lot of evidence, right? We're talking about one text. Yeah, an important text, right? But we're talking about one text. Um, I have not found evidence for um, the word gur in the Tengger, with the exception of one place, which is the series of anthologies um, that attributed to the tradition of Padampa Sangye. Um, and these things are called Dagur, and, the, and it's um, sometimes the spelling is uh, corrected to the more typical form, M-G-U-R. Uh, sometimes it's A-G-H-U-R. Um, uh, but it really, it, 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 it appears almost exclusively in the compound Dagur, symbolic songs. Right? And these look a lot some of them look a lot like things that we know well as Gore later. And we're thinking maybe this is 12th century, 
These are 12th century creations, maybe 11th century creations. Um, uh, but on the early side of the 12th century, late 11th, early 12th, and it's a fasc this, is, this is a fascinating collection, um, which has, I think, some of the most um, complex uh, uh, metaphorical language outside of the Kavya tradition. In these, and there's a lot of it, too. So if anybody's interested in getting a bibliographical foothold, um, you can read my article, Crystal Orbs and Arcane Treasuries, where I map out all, all, all that literature. Um, but I think this is the earliest, other than that. Um, uh, huh? No, 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 this stuff's too hard. No, I, I couldn't. No, I, 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 <laughs> yeah, 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 you don't know you, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah good. Not too yeah, hard right for on. Her. Not too hard for not her. Not too right hard for her. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. is too hard for her. But, <laughs> yeah. That's great. Or a little bit of it, not much. Yeah. And, but what that, by placing that in an early um, uh, space, what we're really doing is, is relying on the fact that we have a manuscript of five volumes of Shiche literature that has been pretty confidently dated to the 12th century, that manuscript, right? Mm -hmm. And it begs the question of when Milarepa starts, because from a text critical perspective, that's a much more complicated question. Yeah. And we lead, lead into our second category here, classic gore. Classic gore. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we were thinking about this starting with mm -hmm. Mila Corpus, and up to, but not really including Tony and Haruka, because he was kind of his own thing. Um, so there's a lot one could say about the Mila collection. The one sort of data point that we put down on the list here is um, what I think is probably the earliest collection, Gore collection, which is part of a non-Gore, it's not an autonomous, separate collection mm. of just Gore, but it's kind of in bounded by a little biographical section in the beginning and the death at the end, um, is what's often referred to as the Buchen Chimie, actually the 12 great disciples, it's attributed to the, uh, the composition of 12 close disciples of Milarepa, and it's difficult to really argue for that on the basis of like firm historical evidence, but we know at least four sections, four chapters from the Gore collection um, are signed by two of Mila's disciples, and I, mean, I think we can sort of make that fairly confidently. Um, and it's, uh, we know for sure that this that these collections, so the Bujin Chuni is the first, I think, of a long series of early collections known as the Black Treasure, the Black Treasury, the Zunangma, and there were many redactions of it, many forms traced over time, which I wrote about in the, uh, the Yogan and the Mad Men. Um, but I think the point of all of this is that it happens early on, perhaps within a generation after, after his death, and that's pretty early. And the collection of the Puchin Chuni and the somewhat later ones are really big. I mean, they're almost as big. In some cases, they're actually larger than Song Yun's collections uh, that he put together many centuries later. So that is evidence for a really active, pretty early uh, practice of collecting core together. And they're highly structured, they're in the, the gore are, are assembled in separate cycles or chapters that mix prose, there's like prose frames, and then the gore, their interactions with different characters, so it really is kind of a complex model already from an early period. Uh, but we can contrast that with other early collections, uh, like Lama Shang. Um, there's the, uh, in the writing of Nyang Rel, Nime Ozer, uh, presents Gurumbache as a singer of gore, maybe not necessarily a classic gore boom, but evidence uh, for a thing called gore. And then the last data point we put in this section uh, is this beautiful, although small, collection of Kodrapa that was translated by uh, Cyrus Stern. And that also seems to be its own thing. It's small, they're mostly short gore, um, I don't know that there's an overarching kind of organizational principle, and yet there it is as an autonomous collection of core, and he was fairly early. I think there's some question as to when the collection itself was assembled, and I don't know that we remember if Sai uh, if actually discusses that in, uh, in his translation. Which, which book? Of, of Kodrapa, it's called? Cyrus's book, The Hermit of Gill Cliffs. Oh, yeah, Hermit. 
thought that was a Sun and Earth project. It is, yeah. He translates it from a print, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, from probably an, I don't know, early and, right, 16th, and, 16th century. And, and, yeah. and we actually, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute, yeah. the list of the Gore collections yeah. that come out of Song Yun's seed in Trakotasso. Um, but the point being that Kodrakpa is an early figure that has a, you know, a collection of materials attributed to him and it's, that occurs quite early. So there's all sorts of interesting projects to do uh, in this early collection. Um, and because of its com complexity, because of the, the types of literature aren't fixed, but I mean, a great place to start is looking at the Gur attributed to Guru Rinpoche in Yang Rao's uh, Sanglingma, mm -hmm. um, is the, the, the major biography of him. And if you recall that um, uh, book from um, Eric Schmidt's translation or from reading the Tibetan, basically the last 10 chapters are songs. Right. Not all of them are called Gore. Some of them are called Gore. My, my kind of my, my my shallow read is that, well, the ones that are Gore are more about me. They're more they're they're more I focused uh, from about Guru Rinpoche and the other and the Shelchem and the Sheldam and the things that aren't aren't, aren't marked, are more about the audience. They're more about those are more you know you should do things or right, this is how it is for you. That's again that's very impressionistic and I, but I think that's the kind of question you can ask and track it through right so. Well, one of the, so that's a, that's a, it's a long-range question. When does Gore become um, uh, lyric poetry in the sense that we think about it as one of its major iterations now that's, that, that's really about the expression of experience, right? Be it emotional experience, ex uh, spiritual experience, experience of a place, et cetera. Um, the, the question of dating is, is actually a huge one here. We always point to uh, Shang as, to, uh, uh, as an early writer of Gore. And, it's true, there are many things called Gur and Lu. He wrote a lot of poetry. Um, but the textual history is not at all clear. And I'll give you one counterexample that really destabilizes the idea that we can look at an author and what's attributed to them now and think that's exactly what was happening in, during their period. Um, and that's um, Gampapa, Sonam Rinchen. So I would encourage you to go read um, uh, Ulrich Tim Krog's, uh, Tim Krog's um, work on the textual history mm -hmm. of uh, the collected writings of Gampapa Sonam Rinchen. Because what he shows is that the Tsokchu, the thing that we all kind of think that's what Gampapa did, right, these public teachings, were actually extremely uh, um, thoroughly redacted uh, in, in, uh, from earlier manuscripts, like pre-15th century to fifth, late 15th century or early 16th century prints. right? So the Sokcho itself really only comes into kind of high definition in the beginning of the 16th century, not necessarily in the, in the, in the 11th, 12th century. Okay. So we've got to be really careful when we think about attributing um, a really well-defined sense that we can recognize from a later period to these earlier periods um, without doing that, that textual work. Right. That's why we have to be careful with the Panampa stuff, too. Right. Because in terms of textual history of it, we still have a ton of work to do, and maybe just like limits to what we can do given our, our the available sources. You want to talk about? So then we have the moment when Gore goes boom. Right? This is a late late fifteenth, early sixteenth century. Um, really, looking at the work of Song Yun and his uh, his disciple Lao and Shenangyo. Um, so this is the first moment where the Mila Gorboom, or you know, epitome of what a classic Gorboom would look like, um, is presented as an autonomous work meant to be read on its own. So it's extracted out of the Namgur in its earlier forms in the Tanagma tradition, um, and is presented as a parallel text. And it's meant to be um, an extension of almost like a commentary on the Namtar. It's the Tongan uh, describes it as a, like an extension. Of what's uh, available in the Namtar. Um, but then Trakartaso becomes uh, one example of a place for the production of Gore collections. And we've compiled a list of 13 titles that we know were produced in a fairly constrained period of time um, in this one atelier, in one printing house. Um, so we can think about the region of southern mm. Tibet, of this one valley in southern Tibet as being an important place of production. 
So I don't think we need to read through the list of titles here. You can do that on your own, but it was quite productive. Sarah? Well, I just mm. was curious about this moment of your becoming Bohm and uh, mm. whether it could have some, I don't know if this is an old tradition, but in our tradition, mm. you know, like if we read them, the group, you know, yeah. as a practice mm. together yeah. co mm. on a regular basis right. as a sort of part of itself or something. And I wonder if they could have been collected together for a purpose of liturgy like that, mm. Mm -hmm. like group, group mm -hmm. practice. That, I don't know, but I have no idea, you know, that's, I'm just talking contemporarily, but do you think that would have been a possible thing? To I think so. Well, yeah. certainly, I mean, mm -hmm. the Kagi Gurtso, yeah. I think that was the intention yeah. behind it. Okay. That was compiled yeah. as a liturgical sure. text, but the, what about the Mila I mean, the Mila, it's, it doesn't lend itself to a liturgical reading, right? Because, because there's, there's so a lot of, well, and, and there's a lot of prose. You have to actually read through a lot of prose to get to the Well, court. that's we read, too, by the way. We read um, mm. the sort of introduction about this lama and that lama who wrote it, and then you know it's kind of chronological. It goes through yeah. the Kargi lamas, but mm. it, it may not impossible, right? Except well, for that there's if no. If you read like the like no the, like the chapter on Mila meeting Gompopa in Gorbum has like six pages of of prose before it actually gets to a court. Mm. That d doesn't right. seem like it lends itself yeah, to literacy. True. It's not to say that that there aren't examples of it, yeah. but it doesn't. Seem like it's initial, like like it would be the initial. So I don't know. I just I wonder know. if it would. That what you said was um, that it was given as an a, a extension of the Namtar to yeah. kind of add a supplement to the Namtar yeah. to understand the Namtar better. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Just something. Add well, I was just going to ask. Um, so in the eighties, when I was I was in a refugee camp in outside of Pokhara, yeah. there was a very old Tibetan man there that was well known throughout like all the Tibetans and Kathmandu and everyone knew about this guy and he his thing was he would sing the Melorita songs mm. by heart like he knew all of them by heart and and he and he knew all the the the, the tunes like mm. everyone had a, had a different tune going to it mm. and mm. what I asked about so someone came up um, Charles Ramble actually came up from Kathmandu mm. to record him I wondered if you had looked into that, like the bards uh, of mm -hmm. Tibet that that actually kept this up as a living tradition. Yeah. And he said, I remember Charles or someone at the time saying that he was a descendant. His father had done the same thing, and mm. his father's father. Mm. Like it was some sort of thing being handed yeah. down, and he knew them all by heart. Wonderful. Uh, people would just go and listen to him. <coughs> it was like it was like a practice to listen to him sing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I wondered if you had looked into that if those people exist still or if people died yeah that's such a it's a great quite i mean it's a fantastic topic for eth eth ethnographic work mm. that really needs to be done i know gene smith introduced me to uh young scholars is uh, maybe 20 years ago who had gone to india with the intention of recording and trying to seeking out those kinds of people and i don't know that it ever and recording them and kind of writing that up and i don't know that it ever actually happened which is unfortunate because my sense is that that's kind of a dying or lost tradition um that we do have some recordings from the 60s and 70s like in folkways and the smithsonian collections and things of recordings of of tibetan musical traditions that include some mila and gore but there were not really systematically recorded and they were not really embedded within the like a historical kind of ethnographic tradition right it was just like the stuck a microphone and sped up some people and we have those records um, I would love to talk to uh, Charles I know he he wrote a paper about uh, I didn't saw uh, yeah they, they were bun communities just north of like the Mongyo Guntang corridor in the po Porong uh, I think it's Porong region um, of bunk communities who were singing songs of like victory that referred to Mila, but they weren't Mila Gur. And that was a living tradition. Because so. the, the printing is important, right? It's not, like, there definitely is an ongoing oral tradition. But yeah, so, and, and I mean, the, the point of, of putting these titles here together, Takatasso, these are coming out of an important printing house, one of the most important influential political printing centers. No, exactly. Um, and also is one of 
the reasons why uh, these collections were distributed and maybe were remembered as well as they were is because they were printed and could be distributed and transmitted, circulated. Whereas the oral tradition goes along on its own trajectory and maybe changes over time. So the fourth category we have is the messiest, and that is post 16th century development of, of gore. And so one of the things we see is a, a spread to basically every region of the Tibetan cultural world, um, uh, a, a movement out into uh, the different, different schools, um, and the emergence of people who really, I would say, made their names because of gore, too. Um, and I think, again, most of these things, if you're looking at a long chronology like this, they're not, they might not be um, differences in absolute kind, right? You're not seeing something that totally changes from the 15th, from the mid 15th century to the, to the end of the 16th century. But you're seeing changes in, um, uh, in emphasis. You're seeing changes in quantity. You're seeing changes in, um, uh, uh, slowly shifting changes in in value. So, by the by the 17th century, you know we can point to major collections coming out of Amdo, um, from still in central Tibet, um, not maybe not quite in Kham yet, but in Bhutan also the third J. Kemba Bhutan. His major work is a collection of of uh, of of songs. Um, so. I tend to think that a lot of this has to do with the explosion of printing in the first half of the 15th century. Um, it, it, you know, you just, you, these things were disseminated widely, right? So you can find prints from, from, the, um, from the Tsang region, uh, from what we're broadly calling um, the Drakatasa workshop, even though it's, multi it's multiple places, um, but it really was started by um, uh, Tsang Yun. Um, you can find those in Ladakh, you can find them in Amdo. I mean, now you can find them in Beijing, right? All over the place you can find these prints, right? And so it was a major way in which uh, um, culture through literature was propagated. Um, and they work in all sorts of interesting ways, that process of, of, of print dissemination. Um, so a great example is, is the writings of um, Shapkar himself, which I, I, I have trouble thinking of that as not the greatest collection of gore, although we can arm wrestle yeah, about, uh, um, yeah, <laughs> about whether Shapkar or Milarepa wins. Um, well, they're one and the same. You know, Shapkar was. Milarepa, I know, I know. So. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, uh -huh, yeah. Um, but one of the interesting things you, you, you find it printed relatively Sorry, early. Um, you find multiple prints, but you also, if you look in the um, Nepal German Manuscript Preservation Project's holdings, you find um, and other um, th things we can get our hands on. You find that there were multiple. Um, manuscript collections of Shapkar's gore floating around too, some of which became chapters in the printed gore boom and some of which have a kind of messy relationship to those. So they, they, they were disseminated in different kinds of ways, through print, through manuscript, I'm sure through singing, um, uh, and um, uh, um, where was I going to go with that? Um, I, I, I couldn't show it, but I want to say there's probably a greater impact in, say, let's call it the post Shopkar era, where we can see a lot more gore being produced in different places by different groups of people after that, but I couldn't show the work um, from, from that. Um, and the, a lot of this work just simply remains to be done, right? It's bibliographic work, but then it's also trying to ask interesting historical questions about the last say 175 years or so too. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a question yeah. for the shop. Mm -hmm, um, yeah. I know I, I agree mm -hmm. that I think it's beautiful. <laughs> 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 but I'm really biased. Uh -huh. um, and so I know it's, it's a very big collection, uh -huh. but I don't have a very good bibliographic uh -huh. sense of other collections. So yeah. I think, I mean, at tw I, when I left, I was looking at December 12th, Renaissance Tibetan uh -huh. Assembly House. Uh -huh, right, yeah. Um, large, larger. No. Have you? No. No. Uh, no. 
It may very well be. Song Young Gatso looks really looks really huge, but yeah. I, I don't think we quite have that. Yeah. But then there are these other limit ones that are. I call them limit ones because they don't really talk about gore. So like the ninth Jay Kempo wrote this thing. It's called a Tomso collection of you know tales or accounts, but it's all song. Um, so it's not giant, but. Um, and there's a, there's also a, there's a Zunama edition. Mm. Uh, of the Mila Gorbun, which is substantially larger than Song Yun's version. Mm. There are many, many chapters and cycles that Song Yun did not include, even, and were not included e even in the ones that Lotsun, you know, he published these mm. small collections of songs that didn't make it. So there are ones even outside of those uh, corpuses. What was that? What is that called? It's, it's one of their Zunagma, it's the Black Treasury, and there were many redactions of that, but there's one in particular. Um, which has many, many song cycles that were not really found anywhere else that he chose not to include for some reason. There's a few mm. translations wandering around too. Mm. Sorry? There's a few mm. translations of those, how we're going to call them, extra boom yeah. mm -hmm, songs. Mm -hmm. uh, just kind of boom that people mm. would just find. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just be like drinking in the mountain stream. Oh yeah, but the, right? yeah, so those yeah. were those were two sort of semi-canonical versions produced by oh, Tong Yun's disciple Lotsun. Lotsun, okay, yeah. But that's, so those, that's number five in this list right. here. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. That's Drinking okay. from the Mountain Stream, and what's the other one called? Uh, uh, Miraculous Journey. Yeah, that's part one and two of number five here. Uh, of the yeah, Gurdruk Sok, uh, Sung Yun Torbu. Yeah, uh, the Gurdruk Sok. So it's the Yun Torbu. Okay. Jetson? I was just going to ask uh, about the period well, that's a complicated yeah. issue. I mean, so you, you can read about it. Um, but it's really, it's fr cool. I, it runs, I think, from the Bujin Chuni, which is you know, maybe within a generation after Miller's death, um, all the way up to the probably 16th century. And, and there are many, many redactions of it, which are similar, but they're quite distinct, different in the numbers of songs, the numbers of chapters, and the way that those chapters are organized. So yes to the first part of your question, I would think. Um, uh, there is, I, I, I see a parallel rise. I, the 16th century, the beginning of the 16th century is kind of a watermark for literature, and I think it's so tied to printing, um, because it's not just this kind of stuff. There was all sorts of other printing um, that was happening in central Tibet, right? right? I mean, later the whole thing shifts to the east, right? Yeah. right? Hey, first you've got Amdo, right? beginning in the 18th century, there's a printing explosion and then in the 19th century in Kham, right? So the thing really moves and I, our colleague Gray Tuttle always just says, follow the money, right? If you wanna follow the history of, uh, of the dissemination of this literature as major forms, you follow the money because it took a lot of money to make these things, right? Um, but the second part, that's interesting to link it to the, the mid 17th century and the rise of the Gandhi program, Podron, because the period we're looking at here is it's really before that, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so it had already happened, right? Mm -hmm. And by the mid 17th century, I'm not so sure that there was a ton of printing happening. Right. Um, at least, in my sense, is not as much of it survives if it if it did. Yeah. So that's a good question. I yeah. Have to think and this was that. happening on the. Right. I mean, uh, This was happening mm -hmm. on the margins of the right, yeah, Tibetan yeah. state. Yeah. I mean, from a translation perspective, and then maybe we should stop and because I know all yeah. your comments and questions, but t to me, it's a truism that the more examples of literature you know, the more deft your translation of any one um, uh, example can be, right? You just, you, you're more widely read, you have more strange vocabulary to draw from, 
um, you have more experience and you can see the variety, right? You can, you, you can make less anachronistic um, uh, translations, less idiosyncratic translations. Uh, so I think that this kind of work, for me, that's always good for translation. Yeah? It's not the only thing by any means, right? But it's, a, it's an, at least an enjoyable part of it, if not important. No. <laughs> so let's yeah. Uh, yeah. What, what else? Looking forward to yeah. you all. Comments, questions, connections from other parts of the last day and a half to what we've talked about here this morning? Well, I am a sub-guru, but yeah. I don't do, well, mm. it's not officially called guru, but mm. I certainly do anthology. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, multiple mm. author on yeah. anthologies. Yeah. And uh, just what you just said, more fun. It's so mm -hmm. dreadfully repetitive. <laughs> 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 I mean, I'm just you know, yeah. dying over here. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. And um, even fairly interesting material becomes yeah. repeated. I, I don't uh -huh. know if that happens with Gore. Yeah. Do you, what's your experience doing that? I mean, it's, uh, well, you know, it's every author's take on the same subject. Yeah. That's a good. I mean, I have an. I have a. Per, I have a personal answer for that. Is that, and that's that. I don't get trans. I don't get paid to translate whole collections. Okay. So, <laughs> so, so, so. But what that means is that I can. I, and and I'm, sure. I'm. I'm saying, I'm, There's limits. You know, there's limits to the, the, the value and, yeah. of this. But I can, I can pick and choose what I find is interesting. So, yeah. like, I'm probably never going to translate all of uh, Shopkar Guru. Like, that's not. No one's ever going to pay me to do that, right? Right? It's too. It's too much. So, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. So the whole thing, right? But right? Right? Oh yeah. Sure. But I think yeah. So. Hmm? Yeah. Of Shopkar, yeah. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. Yeah, been yeah, and she did so. Uh, she did twenty-two out of three hundred songs in Sharkat and Gautzo's collection. So it's a pittance. Right? I mean, it's a, it was an essential work. That's like the most important book on the study of Gord is Victoria Sujata's song, Tibetan songs of realization. But it's just a fragment, right? And she picked what she liked. And you know, to be honest, that's what I can do. But then I can, what you get to do, right, is you get to range wide over the tradition. And I guess I mean more not a, not a, um, not a, 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 a vertical, yeah. uh, but a horizontal. At, at um, the same time, kind of I think it's also a, a, a kind of truism that in looking mm -hmm. at Gore, there's an incredible amount of, of diversity. There's an incredible range. Yeah. You look at any particular yeah. collection, I mean, even from mm -hmm. a yeah, superficial so level, that they're mm -hmm. really different. Well, Even if they follow similar structures or emotional content or okay. sort of you know modes of expression, things like that, I mean, they're really... Yeah. Well, let me ask it a different way. Since they, at mm. some point, decided it was a good idea to collect all yeah. the songs, do you think it's of value to do it in English or whatever? Or to do to whole collections oh. together, either yeah. for research yeah. or I would say unequivocally, yes. Yeah. Mm. yeah. It's so horrible, but... <laughs> <Even though. laughs> I mean, preservation Spoken becomes from the an issue. Yeah. Yeah. Would these gore have all been preserved if they hadn't been in collections? Yeah. You know, if they were just like flying all over the mm -hmm. place. But I don't know. I'm just trying to I think it's because I said unequivocal yes because there's more um, uh, variation in form and content than meets the eye. Yeah. yeah. And honestly, some collections are better at that than others. Yeah, and, and th that's why I keep coming back to Shopkar, and it's probably why so many of us do, and it's why Rachel yeah. does probably, because there's so much metrical variation, yeah. mm -hmm. so much variation in, in, in the, just the whole range of, of, of poetic expression, um, down to topic, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Do a question? Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm.
I've won how many people have been around um, public singing of Gore? Has anybody done that? Yeah, like big as big groups, small groups. Uh, yeah, uh -huh. As opposed to the chanting? Or yeah, yeah. yeah uh -huh. I was yeah, thinking uh -huh. of, I mean, in the contemporary. Yeah. In the Nikagi, mm. you know, mm. during Sof, there's yeah. a tradition of singing Sofu. Mm. Mm. And, and certainly in the West now, mm -hmm. a lot of Western sanghas are bringing Lu into mm -hmm. English translation and are singing it in. Mm. Well, and there's certainly some the lamas there yeah. mm -hmm. in New York that sing it. There's yeah. Temple Sojum Gyato was yeah. famous for that in the 90s and now 2000s. Yeah. 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 With guitar and how about him? <laughs> well, he, they do it in English. Yeah. But there are also Tibetan yeah. lamas going around it. I don't I know if the tunes are the ancient same ones. I don't know yeah. about tunes. I mean, yeah. when, the thing about tunes, I just for an example, the men's yeah. retreat and the women's retreat, the three of we were trained together and then we were apart. And then we got back together, it's totally different tunes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> three yeah. Different, you know, yeah. Boom. So it's hard to see how the tunes would really be preserved from. We found one interesting text uh, that was photographed by Carlos Ponzo in Bhutan, um, which is really extraordinary in a number of ways. It seems to be uh, sectioned from the Kagyu Grotso. So they're Kagyu mm -hmm. songs. It's also, an, it's a manuscript, but it's also illustrated. So there are like visual evocations of the you know, moments in which the gore were first yeah. produced and sung. But it also has the yang yik of like the notes for chanting, which are usually associated with more like ritual practices of like makala and I things like that. Well, it's, uh, like uh, notes the same like thing. Musical yeah, you know, like the really? curvy uh, things, like which the, are the same one for the e exactly, the except they're, they're associated with the singing of gore. Okay. I'd never seen this oh. kind of thing with, with gore. Oh. Actually, I, I presented a copy to his holiness Karlapa, and I said, this seemed really unusual. Have you ever seen it? I said, oh, yes, yes, that's the Karmapa. <laughs> <laughs> this young one. It's Karmapa, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I have one of those. <laughs> um, and even though those young yik were, you know, traditionally, like, local, like, institutional, institutionally based, like, every uh -huh. monastery had their own yeah. form yeah. of chanting, their own tunes and things like mm -hmm. that, that there was also, uh, yeah, exactly, that there was a sense of there being a larger yeah. kind of universe of types of uh, vocalization. Oh, that's interesting, because so. it's very common that it was the Lumsek Lutso and yeah. the Kagyu yeah. Lutso and yeah. the Bhut Lutso, right. and the, you know, and they're each kind of different. Each right. monastery has a different... Right. Uh, yeah. And, th and those were, they're important. They're, or they're understood as being important. I mean, you know, oh, it, it, well, His Holiness say. changed the tunes for many of the Kagyu liturgies, I know, that's so which weird. are done now, right? Irritating. <laughs> and yet, this is, I mean, the living con yeah. tradition. Yeah. Right. Yeah. In Dujer Rinpoche, also, you can see he did this very prettily, like mm. the, the trom sound that's, there was this mm. whole opera tradition from Dujer Lingpa, the melody mm. was very, very different. And in Dujer Rinpoche, he completely changed it. Oh. It's, not, mm -hmm. it's not like it was his variation on this original melody. Night and day, it's completely really? different. Oh, wow. Yeah. Interesting. That's very interesting. Okay. Each one has their yeah. own thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. So, the, I'm thinking the classical guru theory. Mm. And uh, uh, I think year, last year, two years ago, I'm kind of reading the Chopolo Oh, mm. uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Chopolo mm. And I'm reading Chopolo I think who is the responsible who collected this uh, thing? He says, Sombo, don't call Sombo, they call it Menga Yatsa. Mm -hmm. Menga Yatsa. Menga mm -hmm. Yatsa. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so everything the Chopolotas works, uh, they're mm -hmm. translated ah. there. Huh. And uh, then he's, uh, I think, uh, maybe s sort of saying there. Mm -hmm. And uh, the most important, there are a lot of gurus there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there's uh, mm -hmm. one guru, he sing uh, in Nepal, Kathmandu, young guru from here. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I, I'm just mm. curious uh, about uh, the terminology. Term again, I'm sorry. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, the Songbo uh, was mm. mm. mm -hmm. uh, Yeah, mm. the, the, at that time, why they don't call the Chopolata Songbo? They call yeah. the Manga Yata. 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 Mm. Yata. Mm. Yata. Mm. And yeah, mm. then uh, we got Bombs there. <laughs> what the <laughs> bombs? <a> small <laughs> 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 Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I don't know what else. Uh, 
guy in the collection. Mm -hmm. The 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 less collection boom boom is that. Chacheng Gyatsa. Martha said no. That's old. Uh, it seems old school to me. Hmm? Yeah. That sounds old to me. Yeah. Did you get something? Uh, well, I had yeah. a, kind of an observation with regards to translating the silent traditions of Uyghur across to different places. Mm. Um, my question had or comment had to do with it, it begins as a genre that's inspired by the enchantment of Rojas or Susara, who is a mm. Rojas, which turns into Gur. And then at what point does the style become an indigenous Tibetan yeah. term? That's mm. another question. Uh, mm. or Let's see if anybody else. Does anybody have any other things they want to bring up? Well, I yeah. Wanna, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah, that's fine. I thought about um, kind of the, I don't know, the political aspects of being identified as a gore singer, mm. especially some of your this collection. But yeah. Mm -hmm. At that point, it seems like there was kind of a, a, throughout, you could say, throughout Buddhist history or whatever, there's been threads of institutional, institutionalized Buddhism versus kind of the anti-institutionalist um, yogi type. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it seems like Gore is very firmly identified with this wandering itinerant yogi. Mm -hmm. And then at some point it became incorporated into the mainstream Karmakagi tradition. Mm -hmm. But like if, if mm -hmm. you look at this list of Sonia Herika's, the people that he focused on are, are the, the wandering yogi types. They're not the high lamas and the mm -hmm. heads of monasteries. And they were of course all produced in a monastery. Yeah. <laughs> so that's yeah. a, a, in a way, that's a kind of projection of what was important mm -hmm. at this moment of mass institutionalizing in, right. in Tibet, but a kind but of yearning kind of back for the good old days yeah. when kind of opposed to the more academic, um, I don't know, institutionalized vein of the the Kaji the Karma Kaji and the Dongpapa and that kind of thing. I don't know. Oh, I see. Yeah. Even within the tradition. Within the tradition, yeah. yeah. Within mm -hmm. the Kagi tradition. Kind of celebrating that history versus yeah. this academic history. I feel like sometimes those tendencies, the, the institutional and the anti-institutional, sometimes they're really like politically at loggerheads and sometimes they're, right, they're really used together in such strong ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, Shark Todd and Gatso was, uh, was, he's founded a monastery, right? And he was, uh, some ways the founder of, of a major part of Amdo uh, Buddhism. He was a philosopher too, but he also wrote these mountain songs, these beautiful mountain songs. Too. Inspired yeah. by the Malaya Festival. 
Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Even though he was not a big traveler, I right? Di- totally his, different his than Shapkar. Huh? Yeah. 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 It's ironic, mm-hmm. right? Because these yeah. songs are extremely critical of, yeah. of uh-huh. monastics right. and yeah. studying and reading, and, and yet here they are printed in monasteries and chanted in monasteries. There's so m- monasteries have the economic base <laughs> to, to produce large scale yeah. print production. But why would they choose to produce this instead of? Well, no, the, but, but this is my point that it's a projection backwards yeah. to the origins of the tradition, right? What what does the tradition hold dear, even though it's institutionalized now, it's the kind of origin story. It's like the mythos, like the origin story of the Kakipas. It really was like the wandering itinerant yogi. There are these great um, recordings that Victoria Sujata made. They're included in a CD with her book, and they're um, people singing at a, a, a festival time in uh, Repcon. Um, uh, Sharkhut and Gatso songs, but they're all the they're all the go run hide to the mountains kinds of songs. And but sometimes there are 500 people singing. You know, I'm not worthy, right? Right? I've si- I've sinned. The only place the only place left is to run to the mountain, right? right? But they exist in such a deep in, in institutional context. In right, in 1998 or whenever Victoria was uh, 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 recording them, mm-hmm. right? So that's like the message and the. And the sociological context are so just so connected in, in complex ways, huh? mm-hmm. right? Because you got to think that right, those are those both support and resist institutions, right? Yeah. As things that people can sing alone and t- and together. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, a, soci- a, a, a sociological account of those kinds of. Um, uh, performances I think would just be wonderful right and we could learn a lot about how people feel about the songs in Tibet too yeah not just in Tibet but Mongolia and Nepal and right well you probably have an easier time doing it in, in Mongolia huh politically right right imagine trying to do sociology of that in Repco yeah. now it'd be very difficult huh? oh I was just going to mention there's a CU student used to be in Repco mm-hmm. student uh, doing musicology who's often mm-hmm. recording little Repco songs mm-hmm. He can play them and he can sing them in Tibetan. He can play the Yang Chan and Paul. And um, he, you know, he's doing that. He's doing research, recording, and everything. And then also performing. He can perform them. It's quite great. And also, he's a Zen master, so it's all really good. Mason Brown. So I don't know if he's going to come up in the publication. But it's fascinating, you know, to have someone with that musical ability that is, he's also a great musician with any kind of stringed instrument, and uh, and that's exactly what he's trying to do. Hmm. Let me make one more pitch for literary history, just as a good like thing to do. You find what you didn't know was there. Hmm? You find what you're not looking for. If you take as your mission to to collect and organize everything within a single you know, within a single topic, right? In this case, it's it's it's, it's gore, right? And we learn we learn about dead ends, right? In the tradition, we learn about things that we learn about things that were maybe so private that they didn't really make it into um, the, the the public sphere. Like I'm thinking of the Ninth Jake Ten Post songs. I don't think he wrote them probably for anybody else but himself, right? Um, and um, and then you, you got a lot of boring stuff, right? But then you you, you you find you find gems, right? That you wouldn't if you weren't looking yeah. for the unexpected. Yeah. It wouldn't be boring yeah. if it was just one text. Yeah, right. It's good yeah. material. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but they're gems. It's true in every one yeah. series. Anything else? Anyone want the last word? All right. Thank you, folks. Boom. Boom. <laughs> <laughs>